Building New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. Our scripture today will come from Galatians, the third chapter, and the 13th verse from the NIV version. Galatians 3 and 13. bless your name we thank you father god that we have been redeemed we thank you father god for another privilege another opportunity another chance to come before you and hear from you father god through your word now lord we ask you to forgive us for our sins we realize that we have not acted out in the manner that is pleasing to you lord we realize father god that our thoughts have been far away from what you've asked us to be now, Lord, we ask you to forgive us. Move upon our lives, Father God, tonight, that we, Father God, will honor you with our words, honor you with our actions, and honor you, Father God, and give you all the glory. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and thank God. Yes, Lord. in the house? Anybody been redeemed? Anybody been bought with a price? Anybody been brought back? Amen. Yes, the Lord has blessed us and he has kept us. Well, last week I uh, began by asking you, have you ever seen trouble outside 
and trouble inside. Tonight, I ask that same question. <laughs> Have you ever seen trouble inside and trouble outside? And then I ask you, which one is worse? Is it worse to have trouble inside or trouble outside? Which one is worse? Anybody? Inside. Inside. Why is trouble inside such a bad thing? Trouble is trouble, right? Yeah. Right? Trouble. Does anybody want trouble? No. Will anybody like to have some trouble? One um, late pastor would say, if there was no trouble in the church, he would start some. He would start it because he wanted to be the person that get people all stirred up. And then he would be the, the knight that shines in, rides in and shines in armor and fixes it. Just for the record, at the New Beginning Church, where there's no trouble, Brother Whitlock, I'm happy. I'd much rather... God get the glory from our actions, our thoughts, our statements, than to be putting out fires. Tonight, tonight, when we look at 3 John, and we will look to close it out tonight, 3 John chapter 3, beginning at verse 9, and we'll end in the, the last part of this chapter. I think it's verse 14 is where, where we end. 3 John Verse 9 introduces the guy that I was talking about on last week. Didn't want to get into it because I couldn't labor on it. Didn't, didn't want to get into it because we want to talk about him tonight. Paul says, mark that man. The apostle Paul says, point him out. The wise writer says, that there are some people and some actions that is evil and trouble. And then he finally says, that one that caused discord among the brethren is abomination. That's what the wise, wise writer says. Paul says, point him out. Paul says, identify him. Paul says, don't let him keep running amok and mess up the whole church. The past prophet, the great Michael Jackson, said it like this. One bad apple spoils the whole bunch. Ooh-wee, girl. One bad apple can spoil the whole bunch. The whole bushel, the whole field can be spoiled by one bad apple. You believe that? How many of you believe that? You think, you think that can happen? Yes, or you have so much Jesus that you don't, you don't think that could ever happen to you? You know, when the statement is made by many men, if mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. You know why they say that? Why do they say that? Because if she ain't happy, she's going to tear up the whole house. <laughs> so, so men endeavor to make sure that the female in the house is happy. Now the Bible doesn't teach it that way. The Bible says it's better to dwell in the corner of the rooftop than in a house with a brawling woman, a nagging woman, a contentious woman. But I'm saying to you, you have to get rid of those who start stuff in the church. Amen. You see, in Bible days, they had no problem with it. They get rid of them. I mean, but now we come, we hear stuff like my daddy helped build this church. My big mama helped pay this church off. When you hear a person saying that they use the raising hell, they use the starting trouble and then they justify the trouble they're starting. Let's look at John. John says, John says when there's trouble on the inside, you got to deal with it. You just have to just go ahead and deal with it. 
I told you last week that the great Gamaliel said, leave him alone. If it's of God, it will go forward. You can't stop it. But it's, if it's not of God, it will die out. Sometimes you got to leave things alone. But Gamaliel didn't really mean well. He was just trying to put it off. And what he was saying is the apostles going about winning souls, going about raising people uh, from one level to the other, going about improving the livelihood in communities, going about healing people. Gamaliel said, y'all getting upset about it, but leave them alone. If it's of God, you can't stop it anyway. He spoke the truth. And he says, but if it's not of God, it's going to fizzle out. See, blessings, blessings that we call, things that we call blessings many times, the devil just handing us something. And what the devil hands you is always attractive to you. There are some things that you, you get presented that you won't touch. There are some people that won't steal money, but they are lie. There are some people that won't get caught doing wrong in the bank, but right, right outside in the parking lot of the bank. There are some people that are very studious when it comes to getting their lesson, getting their homework. There are some students that's very studious, but they will mess up in other places. I oftentimes tell students, it's not enough to get A's and B's. You ought to have good conduct. You running crazy and doing crazy things, but you got A's and B's, doesn't mean you're smart. That means that you need to whip that beat down, some kind of down. So when you look at, when you look at the text here, there, there are four main characters. And when you are examining a, any literary work, you want to identify, first of all, who the characters are. Then you want to identify what the characters are doing. And then finally, you want to identify what the author is saying about the characters. For the, so the first character we see here, we know that the author is John. The second character is Gainus. The third character, and I've, I've, I've studied this, this, this interpretation, I've studied this pronunciation, and I'm going to give it to you tonight, whether you agree with it or not. This guy, this third character, is Diotrephes. 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 Anybody else got a better explanation? Ex better pronunciation? Diotrephes. Okay, so Diotrephes is the third character, and he's the bad actor in the bunch. He's the one that I talked about on last week when you have one bad apple in the bunch that can mess up the whole thing. And then the final, the final one is Demetrius. So you have John, the author. You have Gainus, the one who's receiving the letter. And Paul approves Gainus. He tells Gainus that there are some brothers who have traveled to this church and they bring back a great report concerning you. They say that, first of all, you are in the word of God. You are following the truth. Secondly, they say that when the this itinerary preachers come by, you have great hospitality to them. You're taking care of the preacher. It's a good thing to take care of the preacher. Y'all know that? It's a great thing to take care of the preacher. He goes on to say in the second pericope, he goes on to say to us that we ought to take care of the traveling preachers, the traveling teachers, because they will not accept anything from the unsaved ones. They are really dependent on us, and we will become co-laborers with them in the gospel ministry. Don't you know your gifts to the ministry, your gifts to the man of God makes a difference to you and makes a difference to God? Are you with me? And I've often said, and I say again, never break the tithe for any reason, for anybody. The 10% belongs to the Lord and not the man of God. So if you're going to bless somebody, or if you're going to bless somebody in your house, somebody, if you're going to be a blessing with some bills or pay some bills, guess what? You do it at your 90 percent. So, so he says, gain us, gain us, you're my beloved brother. You've been faithful and, and you've been 
serving the brother, you've been serving the church and what you've done for the brothers, you've done it well and you've done it as unto the Lord. He says that because they don't receive anything from the, in, in my Bible it says the, the Gentiles, the unbelievers, the unconverted, then we ought to give unto them because we are their fellow yokemen, our fellow workers in this gospel ministry. Isn't that something? And people discount what they do in church, but don't discount what you do in the church because God is blessing you based on what you do. And he blesses you based on your attitude in which you do it. So don't get, don't think that your service in the church is so minute that God is not watching. Everything you do, God cares about it. Everything you do contributes to the gospel ministry, whether it's financially, whether it's labor, whether it's encouragement, whether it's hospitality, everything you do, God is concerned about it and God will reward you on behalf of it. So the little small stuff you do, that's big things to God. The little things that, you know, I hear some people say, I'm just the usher. No, you're not just the usher. You are God's chosen one. God has chosen to use you because everybody can't be an usher. Our parking lot attendants, our ushers, our greeters are all called the first impression ministry. The reason why, Sister Brown, they are the first impression ministry is because they make the first impression when somebody walks up or drives up on the parking lot. And guess what? Everybody, I don't want everybody making a first impression. I don't want everybody to, to make an impression because they don't have it in them. They don't have that gift. There are some people that are just good Christians. They love the Lord, they can pray well, they can sing well, but they just don't make it as good ushers. So never say, I'm just an usher, because as an usher, you make a difference. Never say, I'm just a choir member. Never say, I'm just a deacon. Never say, I'm just a teacher. Never say, I'm just a servant, because it's the servants that God respects the most. So he says to Gainus, he said, Gainus, let me tell you, what you have done in the men who have traveled and ministered in this area, you have done well and God is going to reward you for it. Then in verse 9, he flips the strip. He identifies the trouble in the church. He identifies the problem in the church. He says, I wrote to the church and look what this guy does. He says, I wrote to the church, but, but diocracies, diatrophies, who love to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Look at this guy. He, he loved to have preeminence. He wants to be the leader. And this word preeminence only applies to Jesus Christ. So he wants to be the God man. He really wants to take the place of Jesus. He wants to have preeminence. He want to, this word preeminence means he want to be first. He want to, he have an ambition to be distinguished among everybody else. He does things just to be seen. And he does not do it on behalf of God. Some of the adjectives that the theologians use about this guy, the octress fees, is that he's arrogant. He's self-centered. He's controlling. In today's language, we will call him two things, a bully and a gangster. He lacks hospitality. It is so important how we treat people. It is so important how we treat um, believers. It's so important how we treat 
non-believers or unbelievers. It's so important how we treat visitors. This guy, the Octrophies, he wanted to be the man. He wanted to be the one that set everybody else straight. You ever seen somebody that they always want to tell somebody else what to do? But the moment you tell them what to do, they get mad. Take my ball and go home. You know, when I see LeBron James, he, he's just going to chase, he gonna chase the money. He's going to chase the success. He's going to chase the, the championship. He proclaims himself to be the best basketball player on the planet. Statistics may breathe that out. But when you proclaim it for yourself, that's a problem. When you don't wait till everybody else recognize you, that's a problem. So he, he was arrogant, he was self-centered, he was controlling, he was a bully, he lacked hospitality, he was a gangster in the church. Let me show you uh, how, how I see him as a gangster. He loves to have preeminence among them. He does not receive us. He didn't receive preachers. Have you ever known somebody that just hate preachers? No apparent reason preachers never done anything for them, but I just don't like preachers. Don't get into it with them because they'll tell you, I don't like how they raise their voices. I don't like how they tell people what to do. And they put on their pants the same way I put on mine. And I don't like what they ride in. I don't like where they live. And preachers just think themselves something. The octrophies didn't support us, John says. He didn't. He wasn't hospitable to us. Matter of fact, the octrophies made our lives uncomfortable, made us miserable, and he did it on purpose. You ever seen a person who will always find something wrong with somebody else in order to make himself look good? They will always, you know, sometimes you get bids from, from contractors, and the contractor you need to run off is the one that comes in and point out all the faults of the previous contractor. Run him off. He's not going to do the right thing. There's always one, maybe two, three, four, five, six, that would think that they are the, the man. He says that he didn't support us. He didn't receive us. Verse number 10. Therefore, if I come, I will call to mind his deeds, which he does. Paul says, point him out. Paul says, identify him. Paul says, when a man is, is, is in sin, go to him. Matthew says that if you got a problem with a brother, according to Matthew 18, go to him one on one. Here, John says the same thing. He says, when I get there, I'm going to call him out. When I get there, I'm going to identify him. And not only am I identifying him now in my writing, when I get there, I'm going to tell you some more stuff he has done. When you get home, look up, look up the, the, uh, the name Alexander the Carpet Smith. Paul says, beware of Alexander the Carpet Smith, for he did me great harm in ministry. Now we have this guy. He, he doing... See, Paul says he did him great harm. Beware of him because he'll do the same thing to you. But now John says, not only is this guy, the octrophies, not only is he doing harm to the preachers, watch when he goes to the next verse, he's doing harm to the whole church. He says, he says I will call to mind his deeds which he does. Patting against us with malicious words. For patting means that he has evil accusation. He'll go look up something. He'll go find something. He'll go dig up something just to tell it on you. 
And most of the time, it's just an accusation. All of us have issues. All of us have problems. All of us fit, fall short. All of us going the wrong way, the, down the wrong road on some given day. But there will be somebody always looking at you. You know anybody that's looking at you? That's waiting on you to fail? Waiting on you to mess up so they can say, see, you said you were a Christian. Brother Woodlock, you ever heard that before? You said you were a Christian. Now look at you. Brother Miles, you ever heard that before? You said you were a Christian. Now look at you. So he pointed that out. And he did it with a malicious attitude. With malice in his heart. He did it with the wrong motive. He made sure he held people captive. Watch this, keep watching. But John says, if I come, I'm going to tell it on him. I'm going to point some things out to you so you can beware of it. He says, and not content with that. He says he spoke malicious evil words on us and didn't even put it in the right content. Matter of fact, he didn't want you to know the whole truth. Whenever somebody come to you telling you something bad about somebody else, try to figure out, number one, is it the whole truth? The devil majors in half truths. Can you see Jesus? He's hungry. He's been fasting for 40 days. The devil gets with him and say, look, Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. Because I know you're hungry. The devil will always tempt us in the area where we are weak at the moment. Couldn't get Jesus to do that. So then he takes Jesus up into a, a high mountain and shows him all the oneness of the world. He said, I will give you all this stuff if you bow down and worship me. Depends on which, which, um, which gospel writer you, you're reading. One comes before the other. Then he says, I tell you what, go on jump. God angels will bear you up. He began to quote Proverbs. But he wasn't telling the whole story. And he had the wrong motives. And he was doing it maliciously. So even if it's true, number one, is it the full, whole truth? Number two, does he have the right motive? Number three, what will be the end results? This guy is just throwing accusations out. Throwing them out. I mean, when you're living, they'll lie on you. When you die, they'll lie for you. And he took it all out of content. He himself does not receive the brethren. He himself forbid those, check this out, he forbid those who wish to, who wish to, in other words, he forbid those who wish to support the brethren, he stopped them. Putting them out of the church. Somebody talk to me. Is he a gangster? Is he a bully? People are not doing anything wrong. People are not doing anything to him, not anything against God. As a matter of fact, they're supporting the people of God. But there's always somebody who want to stop you from doing what God has called you to do. Because kindness is a gift from God. Everybody can't be kind. <laughs> everybody can't handle kindness. Everybody can't be hospitable because everybody is not willing to give up of themselves. You got to give up some things to be hospitable. You, gotta, you have to give some things to other people that you already want. You got to want it. Then you give it. Don't give them what you don't want. Always give somebody else something you want. But when you have selfish motives, when you have the wrong ideas, when you have the wrong <coughs> motives, let me tell you something. You get to a point where you begin to accuse the brethren. And then when other folk are trying to do what's right, you try to stop them. 
I'm so glad we don't have that at the New Beginning Church. I'm so glad the Lord has not gifted us with that, that challenge. I'm so glad that, that we have people who are working on one accord that's looking forward to everybody, blessing everybody. I'm so glad that we have members that's willing to bless them because we're living in a day that people don't want to bless the preacher. Don't want to support the ministry. They can always find something else to do. But the text says there was a bully among among the people in the church. And when he saw other people trying to be a blessing to God, other people trying to be a blessing to the men of God, other people trying to be a blessing to the teachers, other people trying to be a blessing in the ministry and bless the church. He stopped them. He found somebody who wanted to do it. And guess what? He said, mm -mm, don't do that. It reminds me, not at this church, but at some churches that I've been to. It reminds me that pastor stands up and he presents the vision and people begin to grasp the vision, begin to support the vision. And then somebody end up in the parking lot or in the restroom with somebody and they said, girl, that man must be crazy. I ain't doing that. Well, if you're not going to do it, Sister Davis, keep it to yourself. Don't convince other folk not to do it. Don't tell other people, don't even tell other people what you're thinking. Matter of fact, if you're going to mention it, you need to have energy geared toward making it succeed. I've said, I've said in this church many times, if you're not going to give, if you're not going to support, get out the way and don't try to convince other people. And see, all it takes is a seed. And people like to, I mean, some people that don't want the ministry to succeed, they act like farmers. Why I say they act like some farmers, Sister Whitlock, they act like farmers. They act like they're farmers when they don't want something to succeed. What does that mean? They always want to plant seeds. <laughs> they always want to plant seeds. They, they want to plant a seed in the mind, and they don't say very much but they know what they're doing. Even a question, girl, are you gonna do that? That's a seed. And they wanna plant a seed just to discourage other people from doing what they ought to be doing. Girl, baby, I ain't doing that. And, and when one person says, I ain't doing that, I'm not doing that, I, I'm not gonna do that, then you got 10 people that get on the bandwagon. So they just plant seeds. They just, just plant seeds. They just, they just infiltrate the air with something. The, the sanctified church said they put it in the atmosphere. And once it's in the atmosphere, guess what happens? People just latch on to it. The Bible says that you're snared by the words of your mouth. Keep it to yourself. Go home and pray about it. Pastor got up one day and he presented a vision. And there was a seasoned pastor in the crowd. A, a pastor got up, he presented the vision to the church, and one of the deacons said, I ain't, I'm against it. I'm against it. So the seasoned pastor, who, who was a member of the church, he leaned over and he said, well, pastor, how long have you been praying on this? He said, for three years. Then he leaned over and asked the guy that said he's against it. He said, how long you been praying about it? I ain't been praying about it. I just heard it. Well, if he's been praying about it for three years and you haven't prayed about it for all, why are you against it? You see, seeds. They just planting, dropping seeds. They, they just want somebody on a bandwagon with them. So the ostrophes, he was against supporting the ministry, supporting the men of God, those who traveled, the teachers who traveled, he forbid it those who wanted to. He stopped them. You're talking about a bully. He stopped, talking about a gangster, he stopped them. He went to the extent of putting them out of the church. He didn't support the apostles' doctrine. He did not support the ministry, but he went to the extent 
of ushering them out of the church. Now, Apostle John said, that's much more that he's done. Verse 11, he says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil. He's saying, I know he's putting people out of church. I know he's planting seeds. I know he's against the ministry of Jesus Christ. Now he says to them, you don't imitate it. Don't you be like that. He says, I've heard it. The brothers have brought me reports and I've, I've heard of the great things of Gainus. Now here we go with, a, with the octrophies, the octrophies. Here we go with him and he's putting folk out of the church that's trying to do what's right. Now don't you imitate that. That's evil. Don't you imitate what is evil. That is truly satanic. For some reason people think when you use the word satanic, you're confronting them. And I use it a lot because that's my intentions, to confront them. Satanic. It's, it's not of God, then it's of the devil. That means it's satanic. If it's evil, it's of the devil. That means it's satanic. If it's against God, it's evil. It's wicked. It's of the devil. It's satanic. So he says to them, don't you imitate that. Don't you be like that. Don't you create your attitude like he got one. But what is good is what you ought to do. He says, don't you, don't you do the evil, but do what is good. He who does good is of God. That one who does good consistently living in godly living he who does good, that one is of God. You don't have to judge, you know, the thing now is don't judge me, don't judge me. Don't. You can just look at a person and say, don't judge me. Well, I don't have to judge you, I'm just a fruit inspector. And the reason why you're telling me don't judge you because you already know you're wrong and then you're trying to convince me that I'm, I don't know you're wrong, I know you're wrong too. Back home, they would say it like this, and I got I to gotta kind of reframe it for, for those of you present. They would say, don't tell me it's raining outside if you tt in on my leg. How did they say it back home, McGill? <laughs> See, he, he didn't even want to say it. He says, you telling me, you, you telling me it's raining, and you tt in on my leg. You, you got me at a point where you think I'm so out of it, I'm so out of touch until I believe what you're saying. But do what is good. He who does what is good is of God. But he who does evil has not seen God. This word seen means he has not had an experience with God. When one has had an experience with God, when one has had an experience with God, when one has come face to face and recognized who God is, and when one has come in touch with God and given their lives and their substance unto God, when one has been born again, that one who has born again have seen God, as the text say, that one will do good. As it says, those who... Those who don't do good, they, they don't know God. They don't see God. They haven't seen God. Because if he had seen him, he would be different. Now, is he talking, Sister Woods, is he talking about actually visualizing and seeing, walking up and seeing God as we see each other? He's not. So he's talking about he has not had this personal experience with God. When we come to someone to lead them to Christ, we ask the question, have you received Jesus Christ as your personal savior? Have you had a personal experience with Jesus based on the fact that he died on Calvary, rose on the third day after they buried him? Have you seen Jesus? Have you seen? When the disciples were walking in Acts and they were healing and giving sight and raising the dead and people getting blessed as they pass through their shadows and all that kind of stuff. When all those things were going on, the, the, even the Pharisees came to the conclusion. They are not learned men. 
but we can tell they've been with Jesus. They've been with God. They haven't been to seminary is what they were saying. They have, had not been to, to the school where they, ca- they taught Judaism, but we can tell that they've been with God. I don't, know, I don't know what kind of education Big Mama had, but there's one thing about it. We knew, everybody in the family knew that she had spent time with God. Can people tell you spend time with God? Can people tell that, that God has made a difference in your life? Can people tell that you have seen Jesus? The Bible says that the, the apostles had, had seen Jesus in such a way until their lives reflected this new birth experience. Then it comes to the fourth character in, in verse number, number 12. Demetrius. Demetrius has a good testimony. Demetrius has a good testimony from how many? All. All. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth himself, itself. This truth, remember this truth, the truth is the word of God. So in other words, Demetrius have a good testimony before the people and before the word of God. Demetrius' life lines up with the word of God. So Demetrius was, was kind, Demetrius was giving, Demetrius supported the ministry, he supported the church, he supported the the teachers and the preachers. He had a great testimony. And everybody knew it. How many is it? All? Everybody knew it. Do you have a great testimony? I oftentimes tell you that daddy would go through the list of the people that live down the street from us, around the corner from us. As I'm walking out the door as a teenager, he would tell me, you're not a week's. You're not a Collier, you're not a Bird, you're not a Walter, a, a Walters, you're not a, a Walker, you're not a Jones, you are a Davis. Okay, now somebody tell me what Daddy was saying. What are you saying? He, he called all these people names. I mean, he would just, every time he would use a different family name, but he would call all these people names and tell me as I'm on my way out the door, you are none of these, and he would remind me, you are Davis. Somebody tell me what he was saying. Your actions should represent what you've been taught in the Davis household. Your actions ought to represent it. When our children go off to college, their actions need to represent where they came from where they've come. Their actions ought to represent. So what, what Sister Davis and I used to do is take children as they graduate, we would take them out and feed them at a good restaurant, and talk to them about how they ought to govern themselves when they leave mom and daddy's house. Because guess what? There was no FaceTime. And then you can always tell mom and daddy, I left my phone in the room. So this lady came up with this app, right? Her teenage boy would always say he couldn't, couldn't answer the phone call. So she has this app, she created this app that's available now, is that if, she, if he doesn't answer the phone call one time, she'll wait a while, she'll call a second time. If he didn't answer the phone call a second time, his phone shuts completely down. He can only call her and he can call 911. <laughs> and that's it. He can't receive any calls from no one but her. He can't receive any calls from his buddies, his friends. He cannot call out to anybody but her. It shuts completely down. Parents ought to get that app. He can only call 911 and his mama. And guess what? It's easy to do because he ain't going to pay for his own phone. You pay for the phone. You put on there what you want on there. So he called himself out there doing his thing and on the phone in the middle of his conversation, click, phone goes dead. You didn't, you didn't answer your mom's phone call. It's done. So what we have to understand is that we have to have a good reputation. We have to have a great testimony. And the testimony that we get from other people is important. We like to hide behind this thing. 
my character is who I am. My reputation is what people think of me. So is it important what people think of you? Is it important? Yes, it is. Why? Why is that important? Why is it important what people think? We represent God. Well, why I mean so many people said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. <laughs> so whatever you go through, whatever you do, remember you represent God. You ought to have a great testimony. You have a good testimony. And then when people have, when you have a good testimony, people will stand up for you and say, no, that's, that's not the person I know. That, that's not the person. That's not the person I know. Demetrius had a good testimony from all the people and from the truth itself. And we also bear witness. And you know that our testimony is true. He, he's talking about the fact that you got this one person that will give you a bad rap, that will do something crazy to make you look bad, that will not receive you. They will not support you. But he says, you know that our testimony is true. You know what we're telling you is real. He says, and we also bear witness. We bear witness that you have a great testimony and you know our testimony, our witness is true. It's important that people have a, a good witness. Questions or comments? It's important. So he closes out tonight. He says farewell in verses 13 and 14. John has written 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John to the church folk, to believers. He's told them to beware, whatever you do, beware of false prophets. Beware of heresy. He says that I've already heard of the guy that's coming in, disturbing the peace in the church. So he closes out, he says, I had many things to write, but I do not wish to write them to you with pen and ink. Same thing he said in 2 John. He says, I have many things that I want to say to you. I got many things that I want to tell you, but I don't want to tell it to you with pen and ink. But I hope to see you shortly. And we shall speak face to face. I told you last week, it's nothing like good wholesome fellowship. Good wholesome hospitality. I always tell the joke when Sister, sister um, Henry is around, that in Mississippi, well, Brother Miles is here now. In Mississippi, when you walk in the house, they offer you food. In Louisiana, they offer you drink. <laughs> That's their way of being hospitable. I mean, I mean, they, you walk in the room and they say, hey, what, what are you drinking today? But in Mississippi, they load your plate down. They, they offer you food. They, they, if they don't take you out to eat, they bring you to the house to eat. They'll offer you food. Am I right, Brother Miles? They go offer you food. <laughs> they go offer you food. And Louisiana? You want a shot or two? You want this glass or this glass? <laughs> it's their way of giving you great hospitality. It's their way of welcoming you. It's their way of befriending you. In Czech Republic, they offer you cigarettes. Off your cigarettes. I mean, you go anywhere. You can go to a burger joint. They got, they got smoke everywhere. They offer you. They offer you things because that's their way of having wholesome fellowship. But I hope to see you soon. I hope to see you shortly. And we shall speak face to face. We want a fellowship face to face. We want to, I want to look at you dead in your eye. It's something about looking dead in a person's eye and telling them how proud you are of them. That's why 
Every Sunday that I talk to a child, every Wednesday that I talk to a child, every day that I talk to the child, I'm down on one or two knees. Why am I doing that, Sister Brown? Why am I? I'm, I'm down at a person's on my knees looking at a child. Why, why am I doing that? It ain't necessary, is it? Or is it necessary? Amen. You want to let them know that you're on their level. You want to fellowship with them. You want them to feel comfortable with you. Because when you're, when you're dealing with a loved person, you know how huge you look? If you don't believe me, <coughs> ask Kevin Hart. <laughs> when you're a little person, you always, your neck is always extended. And a person looks three times the size to a little person. But when you're on their level, you look at them in their eyes, you fellowshiping with them, they know you, you love them, they know you respect them, you, they know that you're support in support of them. So he says, I want to look at you face to face. I want to fellowship with you. Big Mama used to say, look, if you don't come visit me when I'm well, don't show up when I get sick. Why would she say something like that, Deacon F? If you don't come see me when I'm well, forget about showing up when I'm sick. I guess I'm the only country, per I'm the only country bunking in the room, huh? Is that right? <laughs> what she was saying is, don't act like you love me when I'm sick, and you don't act like you love me when I'm well. We, we have to get to a point where fellowship is important to us. Relationships are important to us. There are some people that do not value relationships. They don't value, they don't value fellowship. And they always out to just get something from you. How many of you just love when your child calls you when they're in distress? You don't hear from them as long as they're having a good time, as long as they're doing their own thing, as long as their friends are on point with them, you don't hear from them. But oh, when they're in trouble, they know how to call you. If, 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 a, child, if a child goes to jail and they don't call their friends, that's a problem. You, you got to have friends that'll come get you out of jail. But the 98% of the children in this world, if they go to jail, it, their mom and daddy get a midnight call. Why is that? Because they know they're going to call somebody who loves them and there is no negotiation. They know somebody's going to take it. When they get sick, they call mom and daddy. Why is that? Because they know that they're going to give me my bed. Let me tell you, I went home one, one I guess it was a Thanksgiving. And uh, this is when I, I was single and I was driving down the back road of Kenlock. And Mama had a, a car that she only had for eight months. I left my car at her house. She let me drive her car at night. And I was going to hang out with one of my college buddies, Tom Blue, and, and I had to go down the back road because it was quicker to, to Hollandale, Mississippi. Went down the back road, got to Kenlock, got off in some of that gravel. And that gravel just started throwing me and twisting me and twisting me. And I was in the curve. I was trying to lean in the curve, and the gravel wouldn't let me lean in the curve. And when I got out the car and walked back to the street, it was about 50 feet from the, from the freeway by the end, from the gravel road. It was about 50 feet off into to, to a field. And I looked back, and I can only see the tail lights shining from the rest of the car was under, under the ground. But guess what? When I went home, I didn't, tell, I didn't tell Mama, Mama, I raked your car. This is how I went in there, Brother Miles. I said, Mama, I had a wreck. And she's like, baby, are you all right? You, you okay? I'm 30 years old. Are you all right? You all right? It's, it's the way you present it. She said, Mama, I had a wreck. She didn't think about her car. She thought about me. But after she found out I was all right, she said, boy, you left here in my car. Now the explanation is on. 
She had it eight months. And I wrecked it. If I only went home when I needed something, it would have been even worse. I know we're hearing that a lot. It could have been worse. <laughs> it could have been worse. It, it could have been worse if I, if I had just gone home and got in her car and left. But because I was calling, because I was visiting, because I made it a, a constant thing, the fellowship was important. Family is important. Friends will, will love you when you can give them something. But the family, the biological family and the spiritual family is important. Your church family is important. Finally, he says, peace to you. Our friends greet you. Greet the friends by name. That it's important for us not only to greet people for ourselves, but to let friends know that, hey, this person is doing well and it'll be a good thing for you to encourage them. It's always a good thing to encourage somebody, to, to let somebody know that you're going to make it. It's going to be all right. Have you encouraged anybody today? Have you been an encouragement to anybody? Have you told anybody you love them today? Have you told anybody their hair looks good? Have you told anybody I like how you dress? Have you told anybody they got a positive attitude every time you see them? He says, peace be unto you. He says, I want to encourage you. That's what Jesus did. He died so we can encourage each other. Died on Calvary, buried in a borrowed tomb, rose from the dead so that we can encourage each other. And the same Jesus who died on Calvary was laid in a borrowed tomb, rose from the dead, is encouraging us tonight. And we ought to go out and encourage somebody. The door of the church is open. The invitation is extended. If you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal savior, this is your moment. You can get to know him today. Just believe the story that over 2,000 years ago, Jesus died for our sins, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and rose from the dead. If you want to receive him today, just bow your head with me and invite him into your life. Just repeat this simple prayer. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. We believe if you honestly prayed this prayer that you're now born again and, and you're on your way to heaven. If you need a church home or you're in between church homes, I recommend the New Beginning Church where Jesus is available to you. Let us know if you want to join our church, be a part of our church, or participate in our church, and we will welcome you. If you've re received Jesus Christ tonight, we want to know about it. Please let us know that you've received him, and we want to celebrate with you and bless the Lord for you. Lord, we thank you now for this opportunity to hear your word. We ask you to bless us as we prepare our hearts to give. In Jesus' name, amen. It is now time to give to the Lord through tithes, offering, and sacrificial gifts. If you want to give electronically, you can do, do so by Zelle. Our Zelle account is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting.jesus at yahoo.com lifting.jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail in your gift to New Beginning Church P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 That's New Beginning Church P.O. Box 503 Missouri City, Texas 77459 Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. If you need an envelope, please raise your hand and you will be served. If you need an envelope, 
please raise your hand and you will be served. He has done great things. Yes, he has. Great things. Great things. He made a way out of no way. He'll do it. He will do it. Made a way. Yeah. He gave me the victory. 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 Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for these gifts. We ask you to bless them in Jesus' name. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for our Bible study. We ask you to bless every person who has listened. We ask you, Father God, to bless them, to hear you and to hear from you. We pray, Father God, that you continue to bless our sick and bereaved. Bless, Father God, our sick and our shut-in. Bless, Father God, those who are troubled and confused. We ask you, Father God, to bless them to know you, to see you, and to have a personal experience with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we stand, our mission and vision statement. We are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, and I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. You are dismissed. John 12 and 32, you are dismissed.